Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, and we are back in the Psychology of Eating podcast. And today I am with Maya. Welcome, Maya. Uh, hi, Mark. Hi. Great to be here. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're doing this. Um, tell everybody where you are from and where you are right now. So uh, I'm, I'm right now in Melbourne, Australia. Um, but I'm originally from, from Europe, from, um, from Slovakia. So you can see from my accent, it's a little bit mixed. Yes. Yay. I love it, by the way. And tell us if you could wave your magic wand and get whatever you wanted with food and body. What would that big wish be for you? So I think if I had, hopefully I could have three wishes. I've, I've narrowed it down to three wishes. So the first one is that um, uh, I really would love to just eat what my body desires rather than what my mind negotiates. Um, I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, replacing this sort of set of rules or oscillating between rules that I set for myself and then feeling out of control when I break them. I, I want to just eat when I'm whatever my body feels like in a way that I feel like I'm nurturing and being kind to myself. Um, the other thing that I would love is to just be able to really savor the pleasure of eating nice food and, and enjoying it socially with other people. Um, and, and, and then the third thing is, um, I, I would just, I would really love to appreciate, um, accept and it maybe even like my body rather than sort of loathing it and wishing all the time that it was different. I think mm -hmm. that that's sort of how I would describe, you know, my ideal, ideal wish. So what do you think gets in your way? of having pleasure with food, of enjoying it, of just eating what you desire. What do you think stops you from that? Uh, I, I think it, uh, guilt, a lot of guilt. I feel very guilty when I, when I do these things. There's still this feeling of, you know, I don't deserve it. Um, nice things. It's like, it's, it's just a nice to have. It's not, it doesn't have to be, so I, I can go without. Um, I, uh, I suffered from anorexia from the age of 15 um, and, and, and was really like in the midst of it for quite some time. Um, I, don't, I don't have it now, but I still obviously have disordered eating. So I think that um, some of those thoughts of guilt and, and punishment, you know, sort of stem from, from that period when the anorexia emerged. So I think that, um, yeah, just sort of feeling like I'm not deserving of, of those things. Um, and in a way, even though I've had a lot of therapy and I really understand even the, the, the sort of the origins of the illness, probably for me, it still doesn't seem to be enough to, to break those habits that were established, you know, over so many years. Yes, yes, yes. So... What helped you or what do you think helped you move out of anorexia? And, and even though there still might be some leftover or some thoughts, you've you've moved beyond it. What helped you the most? I think what, what, what helped me the most um, was uh, finding a therapist who re I really connected with and who I really trusted and just thought was very wise, um, you know, and it, it took a while. It took quite a number of years to find someone like that. But together, I feel like we almost reprogrammed my mind. <laughs> I, I sort of, that's how I describe it. And I think we, we completely changed my narrative about myself and what was really important to me in life. So I was very, uh, and I'm probably still, still am, you know, like a real perfectionist, very hard on myself, just driving, driving myself. Um, never sort of content, um, always wanting to be, you know, the brightest, the, the smartest, the, the, the kindest, you know, all of these sorts of things. And, and I don't know where that came from, but I, it's how I remember always being, you know, it wasn't, I don't, I didn't have tiger parents. It was, I think it was driven by, by me um, mostly. And, um, and, uh, and so Really, um, the anorexia sort of emerged when I felt like I, I couldn't control lots of things in my life. I went to a selective school. I couldn't be the best anymore. I couldn't be the smartest because everyone was so smart. Um, my parents' marriage was disintegrating in quite a sort of an intense way. And I, I was the youngest child. 
And I felt like, you know, I need to make sure to keep them together because if I don't, you know, my world is going to fall apart. Um, so all I was putting all this pressure on myself and I just, yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, all of this sort of stuck with me through my whole life, uh, just really being hard on myself. And, um, and I think that with the therapist, what, what happened is that, um, you know, I sort of started to question these ideas of like, well, what is being the smartest, you know, in, in, at work or in, in, at, at school, like, is that really a worthwhile goal to have in life? Um, and I, and I really sort of just genuinely started to question some of those, those expectations of myself. Yes. So how old are you now? I'm 47. 47. Are you married or in a relationship? I'm not married, but I'm in a, in a relationship um, for, for the last 10 years um, with uh, a, 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 a man named Mark as well. <laughs> um, and uh, we've um, actually had a bit of an unconventional relationship because for the last seven years, he's been living in Europe, um, which has been very difficult during COVID because we used to see each other about every three months. Um, but for the last two years, we, we haven't seen each other um, at all, really. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a very happy relationship, very caring relationship with um, my partner, Mark. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about your work life? Uh, I've, I'm a public ser servant um, and for I've been a public servant for about 15 years and I, I really enjoyed it for most of that time and thought I was doing something worthwhile and, and you know, it was sort of meaningful. I think more recently I've, I've become less, um, I don't know, less engaged with it and, and maybe want to move on to some other things. But overall, yeah, I, I really, um, I think, you know, I'm good at, at what, what I do. I feel valued. Um, I have lots of wonderful relationships at work. So, yeah, I think work is, is pretty good. Do you weigh yourself? No, I haven't weighed myself uh, probably in 15 years. That's one thing I, I made. Yeah, yeah I made a, um, a sort of, and it hasn't been actually very difficult. I, I'm never, I'm never really tempted, you know, when, when I'm in a house with a, a scale, you know, to do that. Um, I just feel like I know how terrible I feel when I start looking at the numbers and I just think, okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> in your mind, do you, does any part of you tell yourself that you want to lose weight? Yes, absolutely. Every day. Every day. And when you tell yourself that you want to lose weight, do you have a number? I don't have a number. It's more like it's, I have a particular body part uh, that, that I want to look a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's more about the, the, what I see in the mirror. Um, and that's at the, my stomach. I just want my stomach to be flat. <laughs> right, 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 right. So... So this all started back when you were a teenager. That's that's mm -hmm. that's when you first realize, OK, something's going on mm -hmm. with me and food. And, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of people who are facing or have faced anorexia, one of the hallmarks that you mentioned of it is a sense of control. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately a, a, a fantastic form of control to be able to say, I'm going to hardly eat any food and I can hardly eat any food and I can gain this mastery over my appetite and over the amount of food that I eat, which then means that I can weigh whatever I want to weigh. And it is you 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 mentioned perfectionism. So you're aware of kind of the some of the key themes that are connected to having this kind of challenge around food and body you know so you're aware that yeah there's this part of me that wants to control i just want to feel like i'm in control of my world mm -hmm. I, I think what happens to the mind especially when it's young and we see things going on around us that we cannot control like i.e. my parents' relationship falling apart, I've got to control it. And then a part of us actually realizes I can't control that, but I can control my food. And it's almost like eating becomes this symbolic place where we can enact, I'm in control. I've got this. 
And not only am I in control, but in this world, we're given the message, especially women, that if you could have a thin body, you kind of win. You're like the winner. You come out on top. You're not only are you the smartest girl, but you're the thinnest girl. Because in order to be thin, you kind of have to be clever. You got to be pretty smart about it. And you got to really be on top of things. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain reward for the anorexic mind. And mm -hmm. I, I'm going to make a statement. Tell me if it's true for you. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like the challenge for you right now, what it is, I'm going to put this in my words. It seems like the challenge for you is you're sort of ready to get rid of these last pieces, these last vestiges of the anorexic kind of mentality. Absolutely. You just put it beautifully. The therapist that I mentioned to you, she talks sometimes about like the layers of an onion. You know, it started with the food and, and I've dealt with all of those sorts of things like, you know, self-loathing and, 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 uh, and, you know, yeah, all of those things we work through. And now it's just to that, that initial layer that, that way it's all started. And, and because the habits are so ingrained, but it, it's it's just it's really like you know I feel like I'm a very self aware person as a result of my journey you know I've had to be I've had to 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 get out of of that you know deep sort of like hole I was in but when, when I think about it it's it's um, yeah I just you know there's there's it's not just habit sometimes I think is it just a habit that I need to break but there is still emotion there you know we sort of like. There's, there's still, I still sometimes cry when I think about why do I feel I don't deserve this nice food? Everyone else around me does. Or why can't I buy myself a treat? Why do I think I don't deserve it? There's still this sort of like this real emotion that comes up and it just wells up, you know? So there's, it's, I think that yeah, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing. Like what, what is it that that's still there that I can't let go of? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's really a great question. And um, there's a couple of questions in there. There's, there's, the, there's the question of, you know, why is it that I feel like I don't deserve these good things? Mm -hmm. And then there's why am I still holding on to that? Like what's in the way? Mm -hmm. So... You know, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, it's if we were working together long term, I, I, we might I might explore, you know, OK, so why is it that you don't think you deserve mm -hmm. the good things? Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that's really important to answer. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. Um, what I do know is that you know that that's a belief that's driving you. The belief that's driving you is I don't deserve. And that might be enough. Like, okay, I've got this belief. Doesn't matter where it came from. We might be able to figure out where it came from. It's a good chance. And we might not be able to nail it down. At the very least, I could say, you're not the first person on planet Earth who ever had the thought, I don't deserve good things. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't the first uh, and you won't be the last. So there's a lot of us and probably many humans, if not most humans, have had at least times in life or moments in life where that's what's dominating our experience is I don't deserve good things. Mm -hmm. And usually we pick that up from the environment. We pick that up from family. We picked that up because somehow that message came to us from my mother, my father, my sister, my teachers, my friends, or it came subliminally through movies or through books or through videos or TV or however you got it. Mm -hmm. Because we compared ourselves at some point to somebody else and said, well, I don't deserve. Mm -hmm. So all I'm trying to say is it, it just might be important enough to know okay, this is what's lingering for me. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what a lovely place to work. And 
the work I think that you have to do right now just might be a little more fun than you think. <laughs> it might not be dredging up old stuff that's really hard. It might not be a lot of banging your head against the wall and a lot of crying about things. Mm -hmm. It just might be that a good part of your work is the practice of deserving. So the way to heal or the way to change or the way to um, reprogram, I don't deserve is to start doing little things that say the opposite is to start practicing whatever it is that you can do that affirms to your mind, that affirms to your heart, that affirms to your soul, I deserve. And those are actions as opposed to trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Because what's going to happen, I think, for people like me and you, because we can be so cerebral and so smart and so clever, and we can actually figure out a lot of things and be successful because you got a smart brain. And there's times when you have to turn that brain off because figuring out the answer isn't actually how you figure out the answer, figuring out the answer with your mind. So I'm suggesting that it would be really interesting for you to create a list, just, just write down an inventory of little things you can do for yourself that affirm that I am a deserving human. I am a deserving woman. I am a deserving person. Whatever words land for you mm -hmm. and start to do those practices. So that could be very, and, and they could be non-food. You could even start with non-food kinds of practices. What are some of the things that you do in your life that make you feel just kind of good to be alive. Like whenever I do this, I feel good about being Maya. I feel good about being alive on planet earth. <laughs> Simple things. That, that's really hard because I mean, you're, you're actually spot on because even that I feel like I have to always be productive. I have to do things like learn, you know, study, um, read something that, you know, uh, and, and if I don't, if I feel like I'm not being productive in some way, it's like, it's just, I'm wasting time, you know? So I just, I really struggle to just enjoy moments, even in, even that makes me feel guilty. You know, I have to do things that are productive, uh, and, and, and even through my day, if I do something productive, then maybe I can find an hour where I can just, you know, do something like, um, I don't know. I mean, I like burning nice smelling candles and, and painting my nails. Like that makes me feel happy, you know? Um, so that's one thing that I enjoy doing. Okay. Well, I want you to create a list of yeah. all those things. Yeah. And I want to offer a distinction that, that might help you here. Um, you know, in my, in the, in the professional training program that I teach, I talk a lot about really the masculine mind and the feminine mind with the understanding that each of us, whether you're male or female, we have a masculine tendency to us and we have a feminine tendency. And if you're a female, you will likely have more of a feminine mind. If you're a male, you will likely have more of a masculine mind. And I'm considering the masculine mind to be the part of us, all humans, and in particular men, but all humans, the masculine mind is the part of us that's logical, that's linear, that's one-pointed, that's directed, that's numbers-oriented, it's achievement-oriented, it's goal-oriented. It wants to know how many calories are in this food, what are the vitamins in it, what are the minerals in it. It wants to have measurements to understand success. Success means I lose this amount of weight. I make this amount of money. I deliver this amount of information or whatever it is. So the, so the, so the masculine mind is logical, one-pointed, linear, intellectual, and it's moving in a straight line and it wants goals. The feminine mind is more circular. It's more creative. 
it is not black and white. It is not logical. It is not linear. The feminine mind dances. The feminine mind can hold contradictions at the same time. I love this. I hate this. This is wonderful. This is not so wonderful. Mm -hmm. The feminine mind isn't interested in how many calories are in the food or what the macronutrient balance is. The feminine mind wants to know who cooked it. Where was it grown? How does it taste? How does it feel in my body? Mm -hmm. The feminine mind wants to be in a flow. The feminine mind wants to dance. The feminine mind is actually embodied mm -hmm. it's where you're thinking with your whole body. Mm -hmm. When you go into masculine mind, you think with your head. When you're going into feminine mind, you think with everything. Mm -hmm. Here's what my body wants. Here's what my heart wants. Here's what it all wants. And when I'm listening to you, I'm hearing you. You have a strong masculine mind. I believe you have a very strong feminine side to you, but it's just been dominated by your masculine side. And the masculine side is often what the world tells you you need to be successful. You need to be logical, linear, one-pointed accomplishment, achieving. Whereas the feminine mind just needs to love. It needs to create. It needs to dance. It doesn't need to sell a work of art for 900 bucks. <laughs> it just needs to make the art and love it. So... It just feels like it's time for you to embrace the feminine more. Mm -hmm. And the feminine in you is the part of you that needs to step out of time a little bit more and let go of productivity mm -hmm. and let go of the rules of the masculine mind. Because the truth is the, the way the feminine mind creates success is that it creates spaciousness and timelessness. And it allows itself pleasure. Mm. It allows itself nourishment. It allows itself to step out of achievement, goal orientation, and just how do I feel right mm. now? What does my body want? Mm. So that's your feminine. And it just sounds like she's hungry for your <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I definitely feel in the last couple of years, there's been a really like a strong yearning emerging in me to have more of that in my life, like really very strong, you know, just to, to, that sort of creativity um, to, you know, not be, I, I, I've decided I don't want to ever use the word achievement. I, I, I hate that word. You know, I, I really want to just focus on um, just sort of, uh, and sort of to taking pleasure in life and exploring life, you know, having having more more adventures, having having a, a feeling of my life is rich rather than I'm I'm sort of just one dimensionally going for you know achievement at work or progressing in my career. I I that's I don't I really don't feel at my core that's who I am. I I really don't. Bingo, bingo, and and what happens is it's a lot of the masculine mind is driving your perfectionism because the masculine mind is saying, here's what you need to do to be perfect. You mm -hmm. need to achieve, you need to accomplish, you need to set these goals, you need to make this all happen. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's the feminine in you that just wants to come out more. Mm -hmm. And in a strange way, I think that's what's going to help you get where you want to go with food because letting go of the old anorexic mentality that's still there, what I think is really happening is you are letting go of the part of your masculine self that's been driving your life and mm -hmm. driving your behaviors around food, driving your beliefs about your body and your beliefs about your life and letting your internal woman, letting your internal feminine, let her guide you. And she's going to guide you to experiences. <laughs> like you said, experiences where you feel rich, where you feel warm, where you feel nourished, where you feel pleasure. Pleasure is a good word for you. Um, in fact, let's call the inventory that you do 
a pleasure inventory, everything in your life, persons, places, things, thoughts, feelings, beliefs, foods, situations, experiences, everything that gives you pleasure. I want you to have a list. And I want you to look at that list and see what is it that you can do every day that gives you pleasure. What is it you could do once a week, once a month? And that's your Bible right there. And that's your practice. Mm -hmm. So the practice is not trying to beat back your anorexic tendencies or somehow conquer the part of you that's trying to control your food and, and driving you to lose weight. We're going to just let all that be mm -hmm. and focus on the part of you that just wants to be born and wants to show up that when she does show up more, that part of you will naturally subside, that old part of you. Mm -hmm. Because the, the old anorexic mind still, still drives the show just a little too much. Oh, absolutely. It's, 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 it's over 50%. It might be 55% of you is being yes. driven by the old anorexic mind, but you're, but you're really close. It, uh, yeah, absolutely. I feel like that I still waste so much energy, you know, with like, you know, setting rules, don't eat until this time when I eat, then I feel guilty. And it, it's it's the, the, yeah, the amount of energy I still waste on those types of thoughts, you know, the rules around around eating uh, is, is still it just means like it's not it snaps out a lot of pleasure from my life because it's still about rules and feeling guilty when I break them. And, you know, that fear of losing control um, yeah, is still very much present. Yes. So I understand that the fear of losing control means, oh, my God, I'm going to just eat so much that I'm going to just get so fat and it's never going to stop. And this is where. So here's the remedy for that. And just let me say the remedy for that. Oh my God, I'm going to lose control. I'm just going to eat tons of food. And I'm never going to stop. The remedy for that is trust. And the remedy for that is trust in yourself and trust in your life. And if I had 10 more conversations with you, what we would do is we would be talking about all the ways that you've been successful in your life all the ways that you've overcome challenges, all the ways that you've advanced yourself, that you've helped yourself heal, that you've made good decisions and start to celebrate those wins more and see that there is evidence that you are trustworthy and that your, you and your body are trustworthy. Yeah, you might overeat, one day, you might binge eat one day. Trusting yourself means I trust myself enough that I'm going to catch myself. I'm 47. I'm smart. I've learned a lot. You're not going to hold yourself up in the house and, and, and binge on food for a week. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I know that's a fear somewhere in there, but it's not going to happen. And there's a part of you that needs to acknowledge that, that the old fear, you've given it a little more power than it deserves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you might eat something that you said, you know, I really shouldn't eat this. I want you to do that. I would love for you to eat lots of things that are on your bad list, but that would give you pleasure. I would love for you to break your own rules but with awareness and consciousness and begin to really listen to your body more. And, you know, sometimes you listen to your body and it really is speaking loud and clear and it gives you the right signals. And sometimes, you know, the wires get crossed a little bit and, Oh, I thought this would be good for my body. And it wasn't okay. Forgive yourself. You're not perfect. Part of this is you stepping into being a woman with a capital W, a queen with a capital Q. You own your body. 
you have dominion over your body. And it's acknowledging that, that, yeah, there's still ways that you want to improve. But one of the ways to improve is to listen to the voice of your body, the voice of your pleasure. Now, here's, here's another piece of this that I think is important. And that is that I would love for you to start, I would love for you to, 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 to be more present with, I wanna change my stomach. And I wanna see what it is for you that you can do to start letting the energy out of that balloon. Because that's always going to call you back. It's an old habit of the mind. That's where the mind goes. You are not the only person in the universe who's focused on their stomach and focused on their abdomen and focused on belly fat. It's a thing on planet Earth. And if you think about it, your belly is... It's your solar plexus. It's the center of your body. It's solar plexus. It's the gathering place of the sun. It's literally the physical center of your being. It's where all your digestive organs are. It's where your fire is, your digestive fire. We have a certain sense of self here. Mm -hmm. And it's time for you to tap into your belly beyond its fat. Your belly is more than just a bunch of fat. And it would be a great exploration for you. And this would be a really good homework assignment is to tune into your midsection and get to know her more on her terms. Like, what's actually going on here? If your belly and midsection could write you a letter, dear Maya, here's what I want to say to you. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm about. Here's what's going on here. She really needs a voice because you've, you've, you've limited your midsection. And therefore, it's hard to hear it. And as soon as you can start to make peace with your belly more, you're going to let go of perfectionism. You're going to let go of changing it. You're going to start to accept yourself. You're going to start to feel good about yourself. And you're going to have so much more energy for enjoying your life. But the first step is to just start to listen to that part of your body in a different way. So I really want you to channel your midsection and have it write a letter to you. Can you remember to do that? Yes. yes. And, and listen to her voice. So it's, it's, it's starting to give your body its own voice. Who is she? What does she want? And play with her. Mm-hmm. Listen to her. Respect her. Trust her. And make a few mistakes. It's okay. There is nothing you could eat today or tomorrow that's going to kill you or that's going to make you gain a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. So what you thinking after I'm yakking away? I I really, I really like the the sort of, yeah, this sort of exploratory way of, of, of sort of trying some new things, playing with some new things, you know, um, because yeah, obviously, well, I am very cerebral and everything that I've tried so far, like I so desperately, for example, want to like my body and I just don't know how, like I don't know how to, how to develop the thoughts like, oh yeah, my body's not too bad. It's, it's okay. 
And so I think that I, I think that there is it is probably something that's more sort of creative, like you were describing that that will help me shift that. Because I, I hate I hate it. I hate thinking looking at myself or, or parts of my body and just like viscerally hating it, like just wanting to cut it off, you know, like that that strongly. It, it's horrible to feel like that about your own body. Yes, it is. And I'm going to call that an old habit, an old way of thinking that runs itself. It's mm -hmm. automatic. It's you wake up in the morning and that tape comes on. That mm -hmm. music comes on. That soundtrack comes on. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. It just automatically runs itself. Mm -hmm. So it's an unconscious automatic thought pattern. The way to interfere and change and shift an unconscious automatic thought pattern is to introduce consciousness. And here, consciousness means doing things, doing actions that are different from the thoughts that are automatic. Mm -hmm. So how do I love my body? By doing the things that demonstrate love for your body. I like to paint my nails. Great. There's one. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to light beautiful smelling candles. Great. There's two. Mm -hmm. And I want you to have a nice long list of everything that you can think of in life, whatever it is that gives you pleasure. And you start to do those things. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a practice. It is practical. Mm -hmm. And it might feel very uncomfortable to do good things for yourself and to do pleasurable things for yourself. Well, wait a second. I don't deserve this. Okay, but you have to do it anyway. Um, yeah. Get yourself, buy a massage for yourself if you could afford it. Um, mm -hmm. Buy some pretty things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Create experiences for yourself that will make you feel good. And all they're doing is making you feel good and making mm -hmm. you feel happy to be alive and happy to be you. Mm -hmm. As you do that more and more, you're sending your body, your life, your soul, the signal that... I deserve. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to receive. Mm -hmm. So the way you change that is by actions, not by trying to change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And do you have any tips for, you know, obviously the barriers sometimes to doing that. Uh, and it's sort of, it's almost like so um, unbelievable to have to say this, but, you know, I feel guilty and I feel anxious doing nice things for myself, you know? So for me, it's like torture, you know, it feels hor horrible. Like I, you know, to go to a cafe and buy myself something nice um, with my, when I go with, out with my friend, it's like, I have to, I have to psychologically psych myself up. It's not a pleasurable experience. What, what, what can I do to lessen that anxiety, that guilt afterwards as well? Sure. Okay. So one thing that comes to mind do you have any friends in your life who could be support friends, the kind of friends that you tell them, like girlfriends who you say, hey, here's what I'm going through. I'm really learning how to do good things for myself. Doing good things for myself makes me feel guilty. And I just need somebody that I could either do these good things with or that I might be able to call you and I might need a little bit of a pep talk and you just tell me, Maya, you really deserve this. Do you have anybody like that in your life? Uh, absolutely. I, I'm very lucky. I, I have quite a few people like that who okay. I can be just totally honest with. Yeah. So I want you to enroll and enlist those people in being your, your cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. You need cheerleaders who, who are going to cheer you on. Um, I especially want you to identify friends that you have that might be in their own life good at treating themselves well. <laughs> I have friends like that and I love spending time with them because it's just so wonderful to see, you know, people like that. Yeah. Yes. So hang out with them more, do more things with them, have them be your support people and learn from them, question them, interview them. Like, mm -hmm. like literally, how do you not feel guilty? How do you just, just, and, and make it fun like you're doing right now, because it's kind of fun. So it, it's, you know, there's a popular term now, you know, gamify it, like make it into a game, make it into something fun. Mm -hmm. So it's not a chore. So enlisting your friends, 
I think is a really great one. And having friends that you can call up if you're, if you start to go into the guilt place or the shame place of like, Hey, this is just a support call. I just, I just need a little help. And I just want to feel good about myself. And I just did such and such. And I'm feeling guilty that I spent money on myself or spent time doing something good. And I wasn't being productive. Like help. Just tell me I deserve it. And it's, it's as simple as that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just getting people in your environment who know you and love you and want to support you to give you that support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that sounds good. Yeah, and I, um, if if I may, I also wanted to ask you. So you know, as a, through my journey through through anorexia, um, you know, I I developed a way of 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 um, I guess surviving through that period where um, you know, and I know you've done a few sessions on sort of you know nighttime eating, but my rule for many many years was you know from from morning to evening I can't eat, so I didn't eat for for many. Years years and anything and my body somehow adjusted to that and then from eight o'clock I could eat um and 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 still you know very little variety of foods but you know it was like I developed this routine of looking forward to that sort of almost like this sort of outlet of eating um in the evening and and over the last you know five to ten years I've started to eat more during the day. I still sort of don't eat meals. I just snack mainly because to eat a meal it's like my mind you know is uh, like is much more conscious that I've eaten. So I sort of this is how I like this you know I, I try to fool it I think by by just snacking. But I still want to have that. I feel, you know, just almost sort of depressed when I can't have that evening routine with my, with you know, that I, it's almost like an outlet. It's like a relaxation. Sure. And I, I just, I don't know how to let go of it. I've tried so hard to not need it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the long term, what what I would like for you, my wish for you is that you you get on regular meals during the day mm. and part of that a big part of that is you joining the rest of us mm. because there's a part of you that remains unique and separate because you're doing something different from 98 percent of people in how you do your eating style. And it sets you apart. It keeps you in a certain box. Mm -hmm. And you don't fully join in with us. And it, it's, it's, it can be isolating for you, is what I'm getting. And of course, in the past, that evening meal became a celebration and a prize and something you look forward to because you were starving during the day for goodness sake. I would look forward, to, anybody would look forward, to, a dog would look forward to that. A cat would look forward, a bird would, every creature would look forward to that evening meal if they couldn't eat during the day. So, so there's nothing wrong with you there. Of course you're gonna want that. So that's not your problem. Anybody that doesn't eat during the day, you will want the evening meal. And you will celebrate it, and it's going to be your outlet 100%. Why? Because you're a human being, and you need to eat, number one. Number two, you're a human being, and you need the eating experience. This is where we differ from the creatures, because humans are cultured around food. We want taste. We want pleasure. We want aroma. We want satisfaction. We want nourishment. We want an experience you want to sit in the coffee shop. You want to sit at dinner. You want to go to meals with your friends. You want to celebrate. You want to go to a farmer's market. You want to see beautiful colors and smell amazing food. So you've, you, you've separated yourself out from that a little bit in order to stay in anorexic mind. And the fear, I know, is that, well, if I start eating during the day, I'm going to gain weight. And this is where you're going to have to trust yourself because there's going to be an adjustment period. There's going to be an adjustment period where 
your metabolism has to find its natural place. And it hasn't been in its natural place for a while. So what happens is your body has a rhythm. Every human body has a rhythm. We wake up. The moment you wake up, wakeful hormones are coming into play. Digestive system is coming into play. Body temperature rises. Metabolism increases. Hormones like testosterone increase. Cortisol increases. It's all waking us up so we can be in our day and go about and hunt and gather and mate and do things. And the body wants to digest. The body wants to calorie burn. And what you've done is you've trained your metabolism to basically not have a lot during the day. Mm. And it just so happens that your peak metabolic hours are, you know, 12 to 130. That's when your digestion and your calorie burning is strongest. Your lowest calorie burning hours are going to be in the late evening and forward. Mm -hmm. So it just might be that once you start to make a shift to eating a breakfast and a lunch and a dinner, you might gain some weight. But your body right now, there's a part of your body that's 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 starving. Mm -hmm. It's in a it's probably in a bit of a survival response because it's going through every day thinking, where the hell is the food? I must be on a desert island. So what happens for people who have been dieting but don't lose weight mm -hmm. is that when I work with them and I put them on food, when I put them back on food, many of them, not all, but many of them initially gain some weight mm -hmm. because their body is just like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And chances are you might even be gaining more muscle weight because, you know, I don't know your percent muscle, percent body fat. Muscle is your calorie burning tissue. And if you're not getting enough protein during the day, you're, you're going to be deficient in the building block of your muscles. Mm -hmm. And just even adding a pound or two of muscle will make a big difference in how your body calorie burns and how you metabolize. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit more complex, but I'm mm -hmm. saying that that's where I want to see you go. Your evening meal will always be the most important thing if you are not eating during the day. So mm -hmm. I would love to see you experiment and really what it is, it's you coming back into life. Mm -hmm. Because what is the anorexic me mentality really doing? It's saying I'm separate, I'm different. I don't need food. Mm -hmm. You guys need food. You guys are eating food. I don't. Mm -hmm. And the most extreme form of anorexia is you don't eat and you die. Mm -hmm. And I've known people who've died. Mm -hmm. I.e., in its extreme, anorexia is taking us out of the body. It takes us off of the planet. It takes us out of, out of society, out of the mix, mm -hmm. out of the fray. So there's a part of you that wants to join in. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I mean, I developed anorexia so many years ago, and you know, at its worst, I, I, I was at that death door. I, I couldn't even walk anymore. My muscles had wasted away. I had to be carried, and uh, uh, you know, but really, since then, I, I have still been isolated. Even though I'm an, you know, an, a, a healthy weight now, I don't eat in front of people almost ever. Uh, it has to be someone I really trust. I feel, I feel very self conscious because I eat different things to others. Um, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're very perceptive because that separation is still there, almost, almost as much as it was when I was in the midst of anorexia. Yes. And that's what wants to be healed mm -hmm. is the separation. Mm -hmm. It's not so much. See, the anorexia is a symptom. It's, it's, it's the enactment of separation. It's the enactment of, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be like everybody else. I need to be doing my own thing in my own world. I need to create my own universe, my own planet. And on that planet, we don't eat. In fact, we're ashamed of doing it. 
In fact, I won't even eat in front of you. And so really what's happening is you're, you are coming back into the world. You're rebirthing yourself into the world. And that means letting go of some of the old shame of being an eater. Fundamentally, we are born into this planet as eaters. We are eaters. It's what we do. We're breathers. We breathe. You can, you can try to stop yourself from breathing. It's not going to work very well. It's mm -hmm. not going to end well. So part of what I see you doing from now until it's done is agreeing to be here on planet Earth and agreeing to be an eater. Mm -hmm. And the little ways to start doing that is, like you said, yeah, have meals with friends who you feel somewhat comfortable with. And you might still feel uncomfortable with them, but it's, 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 it's titrating. It's slowly introducing yourself into the world of eaters. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to take away the shame of eating because there's still a fundamental part of you that associates eating with shame. It's kind of like when Eve bit the apple. What's the first thing that happened after Adam and Eve? Eve, Eve bites the apple and Adam, then she tells Adam to do it. And then they're hiding in the garden and they're ashamed that they're naked. They're ashamed of their own body. So there's something very ancient and biblical about our shame, shame about the body, shame of being alive, shame of being a sexual being, shame of being an eater. So that wants to be healed and it gets healed with the rest of us. Mm. This went in a slightly different direction than you were thinking probably. No, no, no. I am. I'm, I think we've we've covered a lot of of things uh, which are extra, yeah, very, very, very relevant to me. So, um, yeah, it's 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 no, it's been a really um very insightful conversation. And I think that you know, in some of those things, I I felt like I was already starting to head in that direction, like particularly that sort of that you know feminine masculine that you were describing i absolutely have felt like you know I'm, I'm very much sort of seeing that in the next five years you know i want to move out of melbourne and i want to i want to sort of go more into live in nature in a small town and you know like all of these things i don't want to be in the hustle and bustle of you know cities and achievement and status and career and i i you know i i i yeah i want to experience the richness of, of life and have new experiences experiences and so on so I feel like you know I've already been sort of got moving in that direction um yeah. but some of those things that you know, the just the last thing that we were talking about the um separation it's I mean as you were talking I kept thinking you know that that sort of like I, I just have this like why, why do I need to separate myself there's still there's always this thing of like I don't deserve to just enjoy food like other people why is that Yes. Yeah. So once again, I'm going to say, let go of the why, yeah. because you're not the first person to do this. Yeah. It's something humans often do. Yeah. It's a way that we enact our disconnection from our bodies, our disconnection from the creative power. It's a way that we enact guilt and shame that is sometimes very primal. It's very karmic. Maybe you were born into this life with that. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about why do I do this? Why do I do this? Many humans isolate. Mm -hmm. Different humans isolate in different ways. This is the mm -hmm. way that you isolate. Mm -hmm. And this is a way that you enact shame and guilt by saying, I, I don't deserve to have good things. I don't deserve to eat good food. In fact, I should be ashamed to even be eating and I shouldn't even be eating in front of other people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's just how you enact it. That's how you demonstrate what's going on inside of you. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to figure it out with your mind so much because I think it's more important just to know, okay, I do this. and 
this doesn't support me. This doesn't help me be the best person that I came here to be. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a different kind of work for you to start to join in mm -hmm. and start with people you trust. Here's a conversation with somebody that you trust and we've had a good conversation. So that's evidence that life, the universe, a higher power, God wants to support you. You have friends that you said, yeah, they'll be supportive. Great. That's evidence that you deserve. You gather in the past, you've gathered evidence of why you don't deserve. Now we do it different. Now you're going to gather evidence of why you do deserve. And you do that with your list of all the pleasurable things you could do and start to practice those behaviors. You heal yourself by enlisting good friends to support you. And you slowly reintegrate yourself into the world as an eater. Mm -hmm. There's a really good roadmap for you. Yes. You don't, have to, you don't have to figure out something in order to fix yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't want you to get caught there because you're so used to figuring things out with your mind. This is a time when it's you do practices mm -hmm. that take you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. Sounds good. I think that you're right. I do have a roadmap. And I'm I, and I and I I want to approach it that like you were saying at the start with a sense of sort of yeah, curiosity, you know, fun, um, not like, oh, I have to do this, you know, I have to achieve these goals that Mark has set for me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They're 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 practices and their goals that don't have a time limit on it. And really it's you stepping out of time more and you stepping out of achieving. And I'm, I'm really happy that you have a vision for yourself of, you know, living in the kind of area that's just, there's more nature for you because nature is the feminine. Mm -hmm. Nature, nature doesn't have a goal. <laughs> Nature isn't 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 counting itself and weighing itself and and putting a monetary value on itself. Nature, nature just just does its rhythm. It does its dance. And that I can see be very good environment for you just to spend more time in nature. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I've really, really got so much of our, uh, out of our conversation. I'm, I'm really very, very grateful. Maya, I'm so glad. I so appreciate the conversation that we've had. And I, I, I just want to say, just listening to you, I, I just have a tremendous respect for you and the journey that you've been on and how much work you've done on yourself and how much you've done to heal yourself and improve yourself. And that's that's just it's so amazing and it's so commendable. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for helping me with this final, hopefully final step to, you know, to allow me to really, you know, enjoy the fullness of life. So thank you really. Great. I appreciate it very much. You'll get there, Maya. Thank you. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I appreciate you as always. Take care, everybody. Hey friends, we're so happy that you've joined us for another episode of The Psychology of Eating with Mark David. Are you loving these episodes? Then simply subscribe and you'll never miss an episode again. We'd also love it if you'd leave us a comment below so we can hear more about your own journey with food and body. And if you're curious about what we offer at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, including our internationally acclaimed coach certification training that's rooted in dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition, please head on over to our website, psychologyofeating.com. Until next time, take care. And remember, having the body you want starts with loving the body you have. Thank you.